Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I'm starting a new project today, one that I'm not even sure what to call it yet. My working title is a non-contacting high-speed multiplexing RF switch. Now, that'll make more sense in a moment when you see the problem I'm trying to solve. Here's the problem that I'm trying to solve. My home built SA has very good amplitude discipline, meaning it maintains an accurate 10 dB per division from a minus 30 dBm reference level to my noise floor of around minus 95 dBm. But it lacks a convenient way to set the center frequency and span frequency to desired values. I can use the built in crystal calibrator to roughly set these values, but the calibration signals are in 10 MHz intervals, which is really coarse. I can also use my HP 8657A signal generator to set up the SA center frequency and span. It's plenty accurate and I can use it to set a much finer span than the crystal calibrator. However, both methods suffer from a common problem. I have to manually swap the SA input cable from the calibrator or signal generator back to my test device. And if I want to adjust the span or center frequencies to new values, I'd have to repeat the process. Now that's a lot of back and forth cable swaps. A quick side note on terminology. For the rest of this episode, I'll be referring to the signal that comes from my test device as the test signal. The test device could be a low power transmitter, my RF power tap on a high power transmitter, the output of a filter, and so on. Likewise, I'll be referring to the signal coming from a crystal calibrator or a signal generator as the frequency reference signal. That's the signal that's predominantly at a single known frequency, ignoring harmonics. So what I need is a way to see a frequency reference signal on the SA screen simultaneously with my test signal. That way I can adjust the SA center and span frequencies in real time and avoid the hassle of swapping cables. One method of getting them both on screen simultaneously would be to add a front end mixer that would combine the two signals. However, that creates some significant problems. The first issue is mixer byproducts. Along with the sum of the frequencies, I get the difference of the frequencies and a whole bunch of intermodulation products. And there's no practical way to filter out all of those products because both the test signal and the frequency reference signals are adjustable. And another serious problem is there's always some conversion loss in mixers, so I need an amplifier to restore the loss in order to measure my test signal's amplitude accurately. And to make it even more challenging, it'll be difficult to design the mixer and post-mixer amplifier to not significantly degrade the good linearity that I have today. So using a mixer is out, and I need a better idea. As it turns out, just giving a little more thought to the problem, what it comes down to is I don't need to actually display the signal simultaneously. I just need to perceive that they're displayed simultaneously. And that gets into the concept of multiplexing. That's done quite frequently in large commercial displays or displays where you're trying to save on power, where you show one image and then very quickly show another image. And if your refresh speed is fast enough, the human eye can't tell because of persistence of vision. Heathkit actually made a device similar to this. They called it an electronic switch. I'm showing the tube-based ID22 here just for reference. They had several models over the years, including transistor-based units. Its intended purpose was to allow viewing of two signals simultaneously on a single trace oscilloscope. It wasn't a true switch, meaning the two signals were fed into an amplifier and a DC offset could be superimposed, but it certainly used the persistence of vision effect to give the user the appearance of a dual trace scope. Fortunately, there's an existing signal in my SA that I can exploit for driving a multiplexer. Let's take a look at the horizontal sweep signal coming out of the time base circuit. There's two portions to it a linear sweep from about negative 6 volts to positive 6 volts, and this leading portion here that drops to about minus 13 volts at the beginning. The plus minus 6 volt swing is what drives the visible portion of the left to right horizontal sweep of the scope. The minus 13 volt portion occurs during the refresh of the time base and pushes the display trace off the left hand side of the CRT so that any changes in the vertical amplitude aren't visible. 
So that would be the ideal time to switch the display from my test signal to the frequency reference signal. And here's my solution. There are three main components, an LM311 comparator, a 74LS74 D-style flip-flop, and the analog device's ADG918 RF switch. I'll begin the explanation with the device that solves the RF switching portion of the problem, the ADG918. It's pretty much the ideal solution. Let's look at its specs starting with the block diagram. Functionally, it's a single pole double throw switch controlled by 2.5 volt logic level input. Notice that it has internal 50 ohm shunting for each port, meaning when not connected to the common port, the switched out port is shunted to ground via an internal 50 ohm absorptive load. Now that's a nice feature. It presents a consistent loading to the source even when it's not connected to the output port. We can use this switch logic by connecting the input port of the SA to the RFC port, then connect the test and frequency reference signals to the RF1 and RF2 ports. Next, let's look at the insertion loss diagram. It's very low, running at approximately 0.4 dB through and beyond the 50 kHz to 70 MHz measurement range of my SA. So it'll have a negligible effect on signal loss. All the other specs, including isolation, crosstalk, response time, RF loading capacitance, and maximum power handling, are all well within my requirements for this application. The only tricky bits are it needs a 2.5 volt supply, including for the control logic, so I'll need a voltage regulator to get that from my 5 volt source, plus some level shifting, as we'll see shortly, to drive it from the upstream logic. It's also only available in the ridiculously tiny 3mm square MSOP and LFCSP packages. The MSOP is at the limit of what I can solder by hand, and forget about the LFCSP, it's just too hard to solder those tiny device edges by hand. With that portion of the problem solved, the next challenge is how to get a trigger from that unique time-based signal to drive the ADG918. Let's look at the time-based signal again. What I want to do is trigger the signal swap during the minus 13 volt excursion because if you recall, that's when the display is refreshing and nothing is being shown. The easiest thing to do is trigger off of the zero crossing. The two zero crossings occur at the beginning of the minus 13 volt excursion and in the middle of the minus 6 to plus 6 volt sweep. If I can generate a square wave that goes high at the first zero crossing and goes low at the second zero crossing, I'll have a pulse that occurs once per sweep cycle. Let's look at how to do that. The go-to device for detecting a zero crossing is to use a comparator. But there are some additional challenges here. First one is the input swings from plus 6 volts to minus 13 volts, so I need a comparator that can tolerate that range. Another issue is the output. I need a square wave reference from ground to, let's say, 5 volts. Most comparators that have an open collector have the emitter of the output transistor connected internally to the VCC-, minus, which won't work here. But fortunately there's a solution, the classic LM311. It provides an open collector and an open emitter at the output. Having the emitter external allows me to connect it to ground so that my output pulse will be referenced to ground, not to VCC-. Minus. The rest of the output is simple. Just connect the collector to 5 volts through a pull-up resistor and bingo! I've got a 5 volt logic level square wave output. The 311 is also very robust. It can handle my split 15 volt supply easily, can tolerate up to a 30 volt differential from the emitter to VCC-, and up to 40 volts from collector to VCC-. So I can connect the VCC plus to 15 volts, VCC- minus to minus 15 volts, and I'm in business. Well, mostly. The final consideration is getting it to switch at the zero crossing. The easiest way to do that is just tie the non-inverting input to ground and drive the inverting input from the time-based signal. In fact, that's exactly how I built the first breadboard of the circuit. And it was an epic fail. Why it failed is the time-based signal naturally has some noise on it, and that noise is apparently greater in magnitude than the input offset voltage of the 311, and also apparently slower in frequency than the response time of the 311, so it triggered multiple times at the zero crossing. That caused the ADG918 to appear to randomly switch signals. The solution was simple. Add positive feedback to make the comparator into a Schmidt trigger. That's achieved by resistors R1 and R2. 
I chose these values to give approximately 450 millivolts of hysteresis, which is more than enough to prevent the LM311 from triggering multiple times on each zero crossing. Yep, I sure made a rookie mistake by neglecting to add hysteresis to the output of the 311. In hindsight, it's pretty obvious. You look at the specs on that device and it's a very high speed comparator and it's going to react to even the tiniest little uh, ups and downs in the input signal. Now, there's more than one way to solve this problem and I can't continue without at least giving reference to the Horowitz uh, solution from the second edition. And if you go to page uh, 242, I believe it is, they show right in here a zero crossing detector that gets around some of the problems that I discovered the hard way. Although I still like my solution. It's simpler. It doesn't have as many of the components. This uh, circuit is made for much higher voltages and has robust uh, protection diodes and so on and so forth. Because my uh, comparator is completely self-contained, I think I'll be fine. The final problem to solve is connecting the 311 to the 918. I've got this nice 5 volt square wave that switches during the refresh cycle, but that's not exactly what I need. I need a signal that is high for the entirety of the sweep cycle and then low for the entirety of the next sweep cycle and then repeats. That's what will give me my multiplex switching of the 918. So the solution is to use a D-style flip-flop between the two. Connecting the 5 volt square wave to the clock input and connecting the Q-bar output to the D input creates a nifty divide by 2 register. Now for each pulse from the 311, I get a signal that switches from high to low with every refresh cycle. That's exactly what I need. I selected the very common 74LS74. It's a standard 5 volt logic part, so I need a level shifter to connect it to the 918. The simplest way is just to use a voltage divider, and that's exactly what I've done here. I chose 22K for the two resistors because those are low enough to make the divider stiff enough to not to be affected by the 918 input impedance, yet high enough not to excessively load the 7474 output. Lastly, I connected 10K pull-up resistors to the set and reset inputs and a connection point that lets me switch them to ground. That's for a three-way toggle switch connection that will let me manually force the Q output of the 7474 to high or low, which then stops the multiplexing and holds the 918 at either RF1 or RF2. So that's it. That's how I solved this problem. Let's move on now to the hardware configuration. Here's the 3D view of the design in KiCad. I chose 38 by 43 millimeters for the board to make it fit into a box that I had, and that's about the practical minimum size it can be. I even had to strip it down to a single mounting hole. The 918 in its MSOP package sure makes the 311 in its SOIC8 package look huge by comparison. My traces are all 6 tenths of a millimeter wide, except for a couple of the MSOP traces and a trace to pin number 4 on the 7474, which are 3 tenths wide. 6 tenths is my typical width for home built boards, 3 tenths is the lower limit for what I'm comfortable to etch. The only reason I'm using a dip socket here for the 7474 is because I already had a dip chip 74LS74 in my stash, and I prefer socketing to soldering dips. Here's the finished bare board. I got really good results this batch with the toner transfer process. Even the 3 tenths wide traces turned out with a minimal amount of Swiss cheesing. It's been dicey lately for me. I've got an upcoming episode in my receiver project where I had a real dog's breakfast experience from making some very simple boards. And here it is mostly populated. Hand soldering that MSOP was pretty dicey. I'm going to need to get a microscope if I'm going to solder more of those in the future. But otherwise, no issues. I'll add the 10 mic tantalums later, but I've already attached some flying leads for testing. And there's the 7474 dip. It really looks like a beast compared to the SMT side. Alright, I'm in the lab and I've got the board connected up to my SA. I'm using the power coming out of the plus or minus 15 volt and 5 volt circuit in the SA to power the board. I've got my scope connected up. Now this isn't the way that I would connect it ordinarily to the SA. I've done something different here. We're showing uh, two channels. I've got it in chop mode. Um, channel 1 and channel 2 are both set to 5 volts per division. And what I'm going to display on this top channel is going to be that horizontal sweep signal, the one that goes to minus 13 volts and then uh, has that linear ramp from minus 6 to plus 6. That's what drives the sweep on the, on the display when it's ordinarily connected up in an SA mode. The bottom signal I've got connected just to my other probe, and we're going to take a look at those test pads that were on my circuit. 
it and hopefully this comes through on the on the camera but if not you can rewind the video and take a look um, in detail where these are so test point one that's the output of the lm311 i expect to see a zero to five volt pulse occurring um, during each cycle but returning to zero uh, at the zero point of that minus six to plus six volt sweep the second test point is here that's the output of the flip-flop after the voltage divider, or in other words, it's the input to the ADC918. So expect to see that be a pulse that's twice the width or half the frequency of the pulse coming out of the LM311. So let me turn on the SA and we can see on that top trace, there's that signal. And again, it's five volts per division. So if you use your calibrated eye, you can see that's about minus 13 volts there and then minus six to plus six volts there. So I'm gonna take the probe now. Let's take a look at test point one. You can carefully align this here. And there we have the signal I desired. There's the square wave going from zero to five volts. It's following that first zero transition there to go up and then it does not drop back down to zero volts here until the signal uh, crosses zero. So that's what I expect to see. Now I'm gonna to go to the second test point and I'm also gonna to have to change the trigger. The trigger right now is set to channel one. I have to set it to channel two to get this to stabilize. And there we go. We can see we now have a pulse that's half the frequency or twice, uh, twice the width basically. It's high for this cycle, it's a low for the next cycle and vice versa. So I've got exactly what I wanted from the circuit. I suspect there are other solutions to this problem, and some of those solutions may even be simpler than what I came up with here, but really, it doesn't matter. I'm not after the optimal solution. After all, I'm not gonna make a million of these things. I only need the one that I've built so far, and it's working. It's working from parts that were inexpensive, and in some cases, parts I already have, and perhaps most importantly, I understand exactly how that circuit works. So with that, I'm done with the, the experimental stage and trying it out. So next up, which will be the subject for the next video, is getting it packaged in a physically robust enclosure, getting it connected to the spectrum analyzer, and showing how I use it. So until next time, bye for now.